It's a passage where the Buddha talks about taking mindfulness as a governing principle in your practice. What's interesting about the passage is that he talks about how you are mindful to give rise to skillful states and to protect the skillful states that you've already given risen to. You're not just watching things arise and pass away. You're trying to give rise to skillful things and to prevent skillful things from passing away. This is an important principle because it's so often misunderstood. The purpose of the practice is not just to accept what's happening and to leave it there. When you look at the Buddhist teachings on karma, you realize that what we experience in the present moment is not something that's beyond our control. We do have a role in shaping it. That's what allows for a path of practice. If we didn't have that role in shaping it, we just have to accept things, like a TV show. Whoever the writers decide the show is going to go, you have to accept that. You can't yell at the screen and tell the characters to do something else, or go back and rewrite it. Experience is more like an interactive game. You have contro some control over how things are going to go. You have some choices you can make. And the whole point of the practice is to learn how to make those choices wisely, to make changes in your mind. We are here changing our minds. The karma that's ripening right now actually offers many possibilities. It's not just one thing or one possibility in the present moment. There are several possibilities. The Buddha's image is of a field with lots of different seeds. Some of the seeds are not going to sprout for a long time. Others are just ready to sprout. They need a little water. So you can choose which seeds you're going to water. Be where you focus your attention, where you focus your desire to develop something. All too often we water the seeds that simply reflect our cravings. When we come to the practice, we try to use right effort, in other words, generating the desire to prevent unskillful states from arising, or if unskillful states already have arisen, try to put it into them, let go of them. As for skillful states, if they haven't arisen yet, you try to give rise to them, and once they're there, you try to develop them. This is why right effort is very directly connected to right mindfulness. So when you find your mind engaged in unskillful thinking, don't be afraid to change it. If you can figure out a skillful way to cut off that thinking, do that. Don't be afraid that you're manifesting desire or engaging in denial. We're here to train the mind. It's like training a puppy. If the puppy complains that by training the puppy you're denying its desire, you're forcing the puppy to deny its desire to pee on your rug. That's not an option. It's the same with the unskillful thinking in your mind. By undercutting it, you're not denying it. In fact, you're very much aware of the fact that it's there. You're trying to exercise the right effort and finding other ways to think ways to counteract that unskillful thinking. Otherwise, there'd be no way we could practice. Just have to accept whatever comes up, and the question of whether we could accept or not accept, well, we'd have to accept that too. And that kind of practice goes nowhere. 
it's mistaking the path for the goal. We know that the enlightened mind is one with no preferences, that it's perfectly okay regardless of whatever happens. But even the enlightened mind has a sense of what's useful and what's not useful, and if possible, will try to do what's useful. Just that the enlightened mind no longer feeds on those preferences. Now, to get to that state doesn't mean that you have to start out with no preferences or that the path is a path of no preferences. After all, there's right view and wrong view, right resolve and wrong resolve, all the way down to right concentration and wrong concentration. You look at the stages in which the Buddha teaches mindfulness. First, there's establishing mindfulness. Say on the body in and of itself, like we're focusing on the breath right now. You try to be ardent, alert, and mindful, and putting aside, as he says, greed and distress with reference to the world. And otherwise, <clears throat> in other words, you put aside any thoughts that would pull you away from the breath. You keep the breath in mind. You're alert to what the breath is doing, and you're ardent. In other words, you're trying to do this skillfully. And as the Buddha describes in the steps of breath meditation. This involves training yourself to breathe in certain ways, to keep certain things in mind as you breathe. It's not just willy-nilly letting the breath come in and go out wherever it wants to or however it wants to, and letting the mind come and go as it wants. You train yourself to be aware of the whole body. You train yourself to be aware of how the breath fashions your sense of the body. Now you can breathe in a way that calms that effect. In other words, ardency here is using right effort. As the Buddha defines right mindfulness, it's keeping in mind the need to give rise to skillful qualities and to abandon unskillful ones. And right effort is a matter of desire. Ardency is also a matter of desire. You realize that if you don't give rise to skillful qualities, you're going to suffer. And so you exert the effort, you generate the desire to do this well. And when you do this, the mind can settle down. And the next stage is to be aware of the process of what the Buddha calls origination and passing away. Origination is not just arising. It's seeing causality, seeing how cause and effect work in your mind. And this requires that you experiment. You experiment with breathing in ways that give rise to pleasure, breathing in ways that give rise to rapture, being sensitive to how feelings and perceptions have an effect on your mind, and learning how to calm that effect. It also involves breathing in a way that gladdens the mind, or gladdening the mind while you breathe in and breathe out, steadying the mind, releasing the mind. These are all things you do. You don't hope that these things will simply happen on their own while you watch the TV show of your meditation. And as you learn how to do these things, you begin to understand how cause and effect work in the mind. It's only in the third stage of mindfulness practice where everything is fully developed that you can put aside the need to make these choices and just be aware of what's there. Be independent, as the Buddha said, not clinging to anything in the world. That's the last stage. But to get to that last stage, you have to develop the first stages. And that means when you see that there's something unskillful going on in the mind, you do what you can to change it as skillfully as you can. You learn what works and what doesn't work. This is how you establish your frame of reference to begin with and how you learn about origination and passing away with regard to the body or with regard to feelings or with regard to mind states. And 
So by changing these things, you're not in denial. You're actively aware of what's going on and what needs to be done, because you see that not only are you experiencing certain things in the present moment, but what you do with your mind right now is going to have an impact now and into the future. And so you want that impact to be as skillful as possible. That's something you have to accept. In other words, acceptance doesn't mean just passively being okay about whatever comes up. It means accepting responsibility. Your choices right now are going to make a difference. And so trying to change your mind is not a matter of denying what's there. You have to be very much aware of what's there, but also aware of the processes of cause and effect. And now what's there doesn't just sit right there, it's going to have an impact. And you want to do your best to train that impact in the right way. That's what it means to be on the path.